All right, welcome everybody to week eight, day three. Let's go over the RPG assignment a little bit. Um, so, so what is non-blocking it? Well, first of all, let's say that um, we wanted to read a string like this. Okay, the usual. Hopefully you guys can all understand this code. If you can't understand this, um, I don't know, draw. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, just ask me. So this reads uh, one word from the keyboard, uh, from the keyboard, and then prints it to the screen, right? You guys all cool with that? So when you compile this and run it, Notice that it's not printing anything to the screen. It's not doing that C out statement. Like, let me make it a little more clear. Um, do type and something. Nothing's happening, right? I can come in and erase all of this. I can type things in and erase it. I can type things in and erase it. And then just type in hi. Okay. So the way that cooked mode works, and this is called cooked mode because you can sit there and uh, edit, you know, it's actually a smart uh, text editing system. You can type things in and erase and correct yourself and things like that. So this is called cooked mode. And cooked mode does not return a string. It does not proceed. It pauses your program. Literally, your, your program is stopped until you hit return. Okay. So I could just sit here forever. And, and the program will freeze, which is bad if you're making a video game, <laughs> right? If you're making a video game, it'd be really awkward if World of Warcraft came to a crashing halt because one person was waiting to type in their name or something, right? So nothing happens. The game is frozen until I hit return and then it starts running. Okay, so uh, cooked mode is good for like trivial, simple programs. Um, it's good for reading in strings. And if you're gonna ask the person their name or something like that, like please enter your name, you should probably use cooked mode. Uh, if you wanna turn on raw mode, then what's gonna happen is this uh, set raw mode to be true. And then when that is the case, um, yeah, um, Oh, uh, yeah, that uh, CN will still pause. Um, let's see. Uh, equals quick read. So you can still use CN and it will still pause your, your thing. Quick read is um, non blocking IO. So if I run this program right now, you'll see you typed in nothing. <laughs> Right? Uh, it immediately returns. It does not wait for you to type anything. And so if you um, type in nothing, it returns negative one or err, err. -R. So you have to use this in a loop, okay? So you have to do something like this. Um, while true, A uh, quick read, and then we will do a use sleep. Uh, use sleep is microseconds. The U is for micro. And so if you use sleep for a second, you do it like this. You sleep for a million microseconds, which is 10 to the sixth times 10 to the negative six, which is one. So one second. And if you do that, then the thing will run like this. Once per second. It's going to read a key from the keyboard and you don't have to hit return. Watch what happens when I hit something. Okay. Up arrow. Okay. So, um, this is going to return the ASCII code if it is a letter. So for example, I can say if sh equals lowercase q, then break. And so it's gonna do nothing. I'm gonna type random keys, A, lowercase a, uppercase a, uppercase a is 65, remember? 
And if I type in Q, then it quits. There's some more stuff in the input buffer. You should have said a stop flickering. It should be in the last one. And, and the sample code that I pushed out to you has the anti-flickering code in it. Uh, basically, you just have to not clear the screen and redraw when there's nothing to be done. If there's been no um, input, then um, there's no reason to clear the screen and draw it a second time. So if you check your sample code, it'll show you, uh, basically, if my position is the same as it was before, it doesn't redraw the screen. Now, you might need to do that if you have monsters that are walking around. Like, if you don't have monsters walking around on the map, then you're going to have to redraw every frame because the monsters will be moving every frame. Or you don't have to redraw the entire screen. You could erase the spot that the monster is at. So if you were... Um, let me just show you. Why not? Um, oh, and you can also use use sleep to... Uh, <laughs> uh, to slow down how much text comes out. Please don't do this. As I told the, the previous class, uh, a lot of students last year were like, I'm just going to do 40 lines of dialogue all at the front, and I'm going to use you sleep to space them out. And then I, I ended up having to read one line at a time. And even worse, they would um, um, make it like two seconds and 40 lines times two seconds, and I'm just sitting there for like over a minute like, oh lord, just let the game begin, please, please just let the game begin. And I would just control C out, I wouldn't even play their game, I'd just read the source code instead. Um, if you want to print out each letter one at a time, you can do something like this. String S equals, it was a dark and stormy night. while I pondered deep and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore while I nodded nearly napping suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping Some visitor. I muttered. That it is. Uh, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember. It's ghost on the floor. Eagerly, eagerly, I wished the morrow. Vainly, I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost one more. Nameless fear forevermore. Okay, so we got a string. Okay. And if you want to print this out like one letter at a time, then um, you you can do that via flush. So let me let me show you how this works. So for every character in the string, what we're going to do is we are going to see out it to the screen. We're going to see out the character, and then we're going to use sleep, and we'll use sleep for like uh, a tenth of a second, uh, a fifth of a second. Let's see, a fifth of a second. And what you'll see, though, if I run this, is that nothing will appear on the screen. Uh, what a nice story. It's the, it's the Raven by Ed Allan right? So when I run it, nothing's appearing on the screen, right, until the entire thing is done. And you'll wait probably quite a while for that, because it's a fifth of a... So it's like one second for every five letters, so uh, I typed out, I don't know, the first two stanzas or something like that. Um... And each silken, what was it? Yeah. There's cats fighting. I don't know if you guys can hear that. There's cats fighting outside of my house. Is 
That's funny because I just posted the uh, the uh, soon with a cat on it. Yeah, they're meowing at each other. They're going to. They're not happy. Um, it's not like people they thumped into my house. Yeah, no, the the Raven's a cool cool poem. Um, oops. And the silken sun rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now it is still the beating of my heart. I stood repeating to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. That it is and nothing more. Presently my heart grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so faintly you came tapping, and so gently you came rapping, rapping at my chamber door that scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was a whispered word, Lonor. And there we go. That's how long it took to finish. Okay. So please don't do that on your software. It takes bloody forever. Now, you might notice nothing appeared. And the reason for that is because you don't know flush yet. Or maybe you do, but um, I'm going to pretend you don't know. If you call flush, what happens is that um, C out also is new line buffered. So nothing appears on the output until you flush the output. Uh, end line does a flush for you. And the backslash in uh, will do a uh, flush also. But if you're printing out one character at a time and you want them to appear one character at a time, you need to do a flush in between each one. And so if we uh, compile it now, you'll see uh, it is now going to type it out, type out the intro to the Raven. So uh, the, uh, the single quote is a uh, comma operator. Yeah, like uh, Mincrelli said. So you can't put commas into um, C++ because the comma operator is a thing and it means something. So they use the, uh, pop, the uh, single quote character. So it, if you leave it out, it, it does exactly the same thing. It does absolutely nothing. It just makes it easier for me to count. Are we in millions, billions, you know, hundreds of thousands? It, it, you know, it's just like why we put commas in, in numbers normally, just to show, you know, how how many significant digits we have. So if I were to take that out, um, the code would behave exactly the same way, right? So it's gonna, okay. All right, so uh, I, I tend to do that. That's modern C++, I think C++ 11 allowed that, or something like that. Okay, so that's how you can get things to type out individually. Please don't do this though, if it's so slow that it's gonna take forever. Um, a little bit of it's okay, but if you, if you make me wait five minutes to play your game, I'm not gonna play your game. You know, something like this is maybe okay. That's um, that's fine, I guess. But um, you're gonna annoy me <laughs> if you if you do two seconds of pausing between each each line. And also, you don't need to info dump everything. You don't need to do all of the text right at the beginning. It could be scattered throughout the game. Okay. Uh, a couple important points. If you're gonna be um, uh, actually, there's two important points that I want you guys to know about this. So, first of all, um, make sure you fill out the top of the file. Okay. So, I want to know who your partners are. You know, they're on Canvas, but uh, I want you to write them down here. If your partner didn't do anything on the assignment, just put your name down and leave theirs off, and they'll get a zero. Okay. I will be looking for that. Uh, bullet point two is only one partner should have the code. Uh, it's a very common thing where I'm trying to grade it and like Min Corelli has some stuff and Corrente has some stuff and they're partners and I don't know which one is the most recent version, right? Like Min Corelli has like a world map that kind of works. Corrente doesn't have one at all. Uh, he's got dialogue. He doesn't have any. And I'm just like, I don't know which one's supposed to be the official version. You get to turn in one assignment, not two. Okay. It's a partnered assignment, not two individual assignments. So what I want you to do, if you are the person who's not turning it in, just be like, um, uh, it's uh, that and, uh, you know, it's in his directory, right? So, and then just leave the rest of your project blank, delete all the other files in there, just leave it blank, 
I'll figure it out. You're not going to get a zero. Uh, you will just confuse me if you have two different programs and I don't know which one is the is the correct one. Okay. Second big thing is I want you to tell me which bullet points you did. Okay. So in the, in the uh, README file, uh, it lists five different bullet points that you're supposed to do. Anything that you think you should get credit for, you need to put there. And this isn't going to grade you. It's not a self-graded assignment or anything like that. But it helps me because if you didn't do the dialogue and world building, I don't need to scroll up and down, like looking for it. You know what I mean? Like if you have like five lines of dialogue, I'm going to be looking for like, all right, where's the other 35? You know what I mean? And so that'll give me an idea of what you think you did. <clears throat> I still grade it all separately, but it helps me speed up the grading because grading a ton of these projects takes a really long time. It takes weeks for me to go through them all. So. And then if you do X credit as well, um, if you're doing the music, it needs to be at least 90 seconds long of original music uploaded on YouTube, paste the uh, URL or I can, or I can see the art in the music. Okay. So you guys understand that? Why did you set her here? Give me a thumbs up. If you guys understand it, I want you to mark down which bullet points you did. If you did all of them, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So, You sleep, useful. Um, okay. And so the, the non-blocking IO, basically, if you don't type anything, then, um, you know, it returns error. So you can say if ch equals error. And um, absolutely nothing. Right. So if, if the user typed in nothing, it returns error, which is negative one. Uh, otherwise, it'll return the ASCII code if they typed in a um, if they typed in a letter, a normal letter. And there's also other things like if ch equals up arrow, then you know it'll you can that's the up arrow key. And so using uh, raw mode, you can get arrow keys, function keys, the insert home end, page up, page down stuff. And your game also doesn't stop. It doesn't block for input, okay? Instead, you can just type things and things, and the game will keep running, okay? So this is a more professional way of doing software development. Okay. Any other questions about the non-blocking I.O. you had? It's pretty straightforward, I think. It's a lot easier to use than in curses, which is how we normally do this in, in the industry for text-based text, text -based stuff like this. Go. Uh, how many people use your color side age? At least uh, you guys. <laughs> uh, I posted it onto the... Um, uh, C++ standards proposals mailing list and it, it got a nice reception there but a lot the, the, the a, a lot of people said well who uses text these days and yeah, we don't need to incorporate this into the standard who uses text and it's like uh, I don't know like when you every time you compile <laughs> something on G++ right like if I break something here um, G++ it's text and if you compile your code inside of code anywhere it's text you know and it's in fact this it's the actual output of g++ with the colors and everything you know like you know having a standardized way of doing that seems useful to me but they're like nobody uses text like literally every time you compile something it's that's text you know and there's a no there's no standardized way of colorizing text in c++ so you know what happened was somebody else proposed a, a colors I uh, think for standardization. And so I said, Hey, by the way, you might want to check out mine. And he's like, Oh, wow, well, yours is way, you know, way more developed than mine is, but uh, yours isn't very C plus plusy. I'm like, yeah, it's not really supposed to be very C plus plusy. It's just sort of, um, designed to be really basic and easy to use. You know, I, I, I didn't propose it for standardization. He was going to write a proposal, but then the committee or not the committee, but like the people on the mailing list were like, ah, who uses text, you know? And, I don't see any need for this. Nobody uses text anymore. It's all GUIs. And it's not like, you know, we have GUIs in C++ either. There's no standard way in C++ to make a window or to read a mouse click or to play a sound. You know, basic things that have been around since, 
oh, I don't know, the 80s, you know? Nope, no concept of it. The still, the only thing in the standard for interacting with the world is text-based, but they don't want to make text-based better, so... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, in terms of people online, uh, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, if you're talking about people who start it or something like that on GitHub, it's not too, it's not very many. I haven't, I haven't really published it or publicized it very much. Uh, colors, let's see here. 17 people, yeah. It's not like, yeah, there's thousands of people using this, but uh, I don't know, I like it. This is, this is something that I wanted since like I started learning to code C++ because there is just no function for that in the standard. Windows has something called key, uh, keyboard hit, KB hit, which does something similar to that, but there's nothing in the standard. And so people are like, why isn't this thing in the standard? And nobody uses text anymore. Really? But this is the only thing in the standard for interacting with the world is text. All you've given us is CN and C out and what we're going to learn today with files. It's all, that's, that's it. That's all you've given us. I don't know. There's, I don't know. The, I have, I have issues. <laughs> okay. Like Java has, Java's had windows, like the ability to create a window and do layout and all that stuff since it came out. There's something called AWT when it came out in like 96 or so, something like that. Java, Java. When did Java come out? Okay, not that Java. Oh, I, I misspelled it properly. Look at that. Uh, Java programming language, when did that come out? 95, okay. Yeah, so Java's had it for uh, a long, long time, 26 years. It's had Windows. C++, uh, they tried. They proposed something, and the standardization efforts failed. So, I don't want to tell you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, 2D vectors again. Uh, if you want to make a 2D vector, uh, like a vector vector of doubles, vec um, like that that'll make a 2d vector of size 0 by 0 if you want to make let's say 10 rows and 5 columns then I know it's gonna be an error thank you uh, const int columns is equal to 10 rows and yeah, let's write it the other way around rows is equal to 5 columns is equal to 10 so if you want to make a 5 by 10 5 rows 10 columns 5 rows Ten columns, uh, which is a little weird for people because rows are, it's the y-axis, right? It's up and down rows. Columns is the x-axis. Normally in algebra, we do the x first, then y. In computer science, we do rows first, then columns. Something called row major ordering, and it's standard in computer science. There's very few languages that they use column, column major ordering. So you do it like this, a uh, vector of doubles size columns. And so what this is going to do, it's going to create five, five vectors. Okay. So it's, it's a vector of vectors. It's, this is going to create a rectangle of array, of array elements, of vector elements, five rows. And then each row is a column of 10, 10 numbers. Um, again, this isn't the world's best way of doing it. Um, I usually use a one dimensional vector and, uh, pretend that it's a 2D vector. Um, for there, There's a reasons that will become more apparent when you take CSI 45. For doing that, you want to have contiguous blocks in memory. It's faster to do it that way. This way is... It's it's I8. <laughs> That's the best I can say for it. It's, it's, it's okay. There's problems. Like, you can make one of the rows... Like, if you call pushback, then one of the rows can grow and not be the same size as the others, or even worse, if you call pop back and delete elements off one of the rows, and you assume it's a rectangle, then you'll go out of bounds and crash. So it's not a super cool way, but it's, I don't know, like I said, I apologize when I introduce it to you. It's kind of the best we have for where you're at right now with CSI 40. Okay, so this is a, uh, there are 50 elements in this, in this vector. There's 50 elements in the vector. And if you want to access things in it, you can say vector dot at, three dot at seven uh, equals 42. And so row three column seven equals 42. Okay, so it's just, 
um, a two-dimensional array. It's a rectangular array that holds numbers, and you can just use each of the points as a separate variable if you want. Um, usually, though, we, we, we do these things inside of loops and things like that. Like, if you want to add up all the elements inside of it, then you can do something like this. And sum equal, uh, and double sum equals zero. And we will need to fill it with data first, right? Because we have a 2D array. Right now, it's all zeros. There's absolutely no point in adding up everything in it. So let's pretend it's full of data, right? Let's pretend that uh, um, it looks like this. You know, it's some square filled with data. Um, it, uh, terminology wise, uh, anything that holds lots of variables like this is called a data structure. So a data structure is just a fancy jargon laden way of just saying um, something that holds lots of data in a st structured fashion. So it's called a data structure. But um, yeah, anything that like, if you have anything that holds onto like a thousand doubles, it's a data structure. And that could be an array, it could be a vector, it could be a 2D vector, it could be uh, things you'll learn about in CSI 41, like queues and stacks and binary search trees and sets and maps and all sorts of other data structures. That's why CSI 41 is called data structures, because you learn about all the different ways you can hold lots of data and make it fast to look up and change and stuff like that. So, so if we wanted to loop over all the elements in the vector and add them all up, we can do something like this. For every... Um, For every row, for every row in the vector, and so this is actually going to be a vector. So it's going to return first time through the loop, it returns the first row. Second time through the loop, it returns the second row. So for every row in the vector, for every double um, in the row, sum plus equals that number. This is going to return zero because we haven't. Uh, now look, more colors. C plus plus standard people. <sighs> so it'll print out zero because there's nothing in it right now. But um, let's just put some data into it. I guess one. I'll just put some. Uh, just put some random. some random numbers in it. And then when we add them all up, we get 400. And I could have used a regular for loop there as well. Rows are vertical, rows are horizontal. So the um, the way that, uh, this is row one. This here is row one. This is row two. This is row three. Eh, well, row zero, let's do it properly, huh? Row zero, row one, row two, row three. So we have four rows, all right? So they're numbered row zero through row three. And then we have here column zero, column one, column two, column three. And again, this is a four by four, there's four columns. So this is a four by four and it's laid out like this. And so when we loop over it, what we're doing is we, we loop over it like this. We go through the first row, then we go through the second row, then we go through the third row, adding up each element in it one at a time like that until we're done. So that's, that's the normal method by which we traverse a 2D array or a 2D vector. Uh, if you want to see it with a regular for loop, um, if you want to see it with a regular for loop, instead, uh, look like this, for size t i equals zero, i is less than vector dot size. Uh, actually, let's call this rows, why not? Okay, uh, row, 
Well, we're gonna start at row zero and go up to row three because vector dot size uh, in this one, uh, row four, because there's five rows. So we start at zero to four. All right. and rows plus plus. And then for each row, we're gonna go starting at column zero to column. And then how many elements are on that row? Vector dot at row dot size. So this gets how many elements are in it, or we can just use 10, <laughs> one or the other. Um, and then uh, column dot size. So again, we're gonna start at row zero, column zero, then we go to row zero, column one, row zero, column two, row zero, column three, all the way to row zero, column nine. Then that inner loop finishes, we go down to the next row, row one, column zero, row one, column one, row one, column two. It's like reading a book. And we're gonna say sum plus equals vector dot at row dot at column, like that. And that's the, this whole thing here is the equivalent to this, which is why I like range based for loops better. Uh, if you're going to be, if you're going to be looping over the whole thing, um, like, do you, <laughs> like, do you see how much less typing that is? Like, you know, and, and there's a good chance you're going to make a copy paste error or you get lazy. And rather than wanting to type this out, which hurts your brain, uh, you just stick a 10 in there and that's fine, uh, but it probably shouldn't be a magic number. So use calls instead. That's also fine unless somebody did a pushback or something, at which point your rows aren't all the same size. You go out of bounds, you crash, you cry. Um, the nice thing about range-based for loops is that they never go out of bounds. So unless you, unless you really work at it, you're not ever going to go out of bounds with a range-based for loop. So they're very useful if you ever need to iterate across an entire data structure. You just range based for loop is just the natural way to go. Okay. So our, uh, we've got a couple important things to learn today and, um, we've already learned some, some things today. We learned about flush. Uh, do you guys remember flush? So that'll, that'll redraw the screen even without a new line. That's kind of important. Um, and we went over 2D vectors again. It's also pretty important. But uh, the big thing for today is we're gonna learn how to read and write to files, okay? So learning points for today. How to read and write to a file. Actually, we're just gonna do reading today probably. Read from a file, okay? So, I am going to just comment out all this code and stick that into a code graveyard in case you guys want to refer to it later. You can, but, um, let's take it back to week one. Do you guys know what this code does? Can you decipher these highly advanced and complicated three lines of code from you? I'll give you a second to think about it. <laughs> Pretty good coffee. I'm not a huge fan of Cup of Joy's uh, drip fire blend but their espresso is really good anyone nobody can decipher the obtuse and overly complicated code i got up there okay. <laughs> it reads x from the user and outputs it thank you thank you otherwise i'm just going to sit here and stare at my screen until somebody answers it <clears throat> yeah so you're going to echo back to the screen what are the, whatever the user types in from the keyboard, right? So the user is going to type in something from the keyboard and whatever, we, whatever number we type in is whatever number gets echoed back out. Okay. Now I'm going to show you how to do the same thing, but from a file. Okay. So let me, um, let me, 
let me make a file called min uh, Carelli, and I'm going to put the number 42 in here. It's a text file. Do you guys know how to edit just random text files? Vim. Just Vim text file. Put it, type a number and save. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you everything except for the key line to do this from a file. Okay. So this is going to read an int from the keyboard and print it to the screen. Somebody give me a variable name, please. Dog. Okay. In the previous class, it was potatoes. The dog doesn't exist yet, but check it out. So let's say that dog is our file. Do you guys see how this, this code here, which is missing one crucial line, which is our, our learning point for today. Do you see how this though, do you see how this resembles reading from the keyboard? Do you see how it's like almost the same, except whereas the CN represents the keyboard, dog is going to represent uh, mincorelli.txt. And I apologize, Justice, if your students are calling you a, a dog. Um, do you guys see the similarity of the code? I think it's pretty much the same thing, except instead of reading from the keyboard, we're going to be reading from a file. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the, obviously the crucial thing that we're missing is how do we open the file so we can read from it? And so in order to do this, we're going to need to um, take it back old school. I'm going to put IO stream back in here. And here is the new learning point for today, F stream. So that is one of the points you got, you got to remember today. New header file, it's called F stream. Uh, everybody, what does F stand for? Respects, that's exactly right. So <laughs> Your grade, what? No. Uh, file or Fortnite. <laughs> Raid Shadow Legends. Yeah, uh, F stands for file, right? So uh, press F in the chat, everybody. <laughs> Let's get an F in the chat for your uh, learning point for today. So yeah, F stream stands for, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so it stands for file streams. And so um, that'll, this header file here allows you to read and write to um, a, a file. Okay. And so the, the big thing for today, here it comes. This is the most important line of code for today at least if stream dog because that's the variable that portnoff came up with uh and then we pass in min Corelli dot text voila So an IF stream stands for input file stream. So if you want to read from a file, input, you're reading from it, F, it's a file, or respects, one or the other. Uh, so, and then you just have to give it a variable name. You have to make up a variable name. In this case, Pornoff is calling um, Mancrelli a dog. So <laughs> uh, the variable is dog. And so then we can read from dog, just like how we read from CN. You guys see how this is like basically identical code. The only difference is you're choosing a different place to read from. So instead of reading from the keyboard, you're going to read from a file. Okay, so let's compile this. And uh, if we type in 42, it prints out 42 from the keyboard. And then if you remember, and Curly has 42 in it there. So if I type in 420, it reads 420 from the keyboard, and then it reads 42 from the file. You guys all see that? So if I type in 9,000, I read 9,000 from the keyboard, it reads 42 from the file. If I edit Mincrelli and run it again, I don't have to recompile. You see that? I didn't recompile it. Um, 
that's one of the nice things about writing your data to a file, especially like if you're working on the RPG project, right? The, um, the RPG project, you might be making like a world map and things like that. And if you put the world map into your code, every time you change your code, then um, you have to recompile. Every, every time you change your map, which is changing your code, you have to recompile. And that's kind of annoying. Whereas if you put your world map into a file, you could load the file into a vector and then you don't have to recompile every time. You just sit there and edit the, the text file and then rerun the game and edit it and rerun the game. And it, and it makes your development process go a lot faster. Okay. So what happens if we try editing Mincrelli and we put um, squirrel in here? What happens when you try reading from, uh, you're, you're trying to read uh, from the keyboard into an integer and you get text instead. What happens? Do you guys remember? You get zero. What happens? Uh, you're, yeah. So how do you check for that? How do you check for an error happening on the, uh, the keyboard. Like if, you know, we're, we're, we're telling C++, give me an integer. And the user has different plans. The user's like, I'm going to type in squirrel instead. I'm going to type in shampoo. You know, that's not an integer. C++ doesn't know how to deal with it. So how do you check for it? Yeah, how do you vet uh, this input and make sure that it was, it worked, it was an integer? For the keyboard, just for the keyboard. Yep, if not CN, very good. If not CN, die. Or if you want, we could do... Something like this, assert CN. Okay. And so if we do that, but then if we type in a number, it works fine. If we type in squirrel, assertion failed. Assertion failed. Boom. Assertion CN failed. Bam. Died. Main.cc line 14. So I could vim main.cc line 14. Hey, look at that. Did you guys know you could do that? If you ever get an error message and it tells you main.cc line 14, you can vim main.cc and type plus 14 and it will jump you to that line in the file, which is where your problem is. If you want to learn more, vim tips and tricks uh hazelton is giving the extra credit talk here in the uh class voice chat channel at four o'clock so attend the workshop and then write an essay on what you learned and you will get extra credit points for your daily uh, quizzes and things like that can't wait to be a vim wizard yeah it's it's uh, it's it's really cool and and i whenever i hang out with other vim people i always learn stuff too and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to watch um, Hazleton's talk. I have to go on campus and make a delivery. Um, I'll try to catch the end of it, I guess. Um, but um, uh, I'll see if we can record it. Okay. So we do that. That's where the problem is. Now, how do you think we can do the same thing for a dog? Somebody's already said the answer. Anyone? Anyone? If not dog, or uh, you can assert assert that dog is true. That's a different way of doing it. And so if we run it, assertion dog failed. So that's a different way we can do it. All right. So cool. What if we had? What if we wanted to read multiple numbers? So you can see it reads the first number from the file, then the second number from the file. So uh, essentially, this is actually really easy. Um, it reads from the file. This is just a text file that just has numbers in it. 
it reads from the file just like it is reading from the keyboard. So just as if somebody had typed 9001 return 420 return, um, that's exactly what we're getting when we read from doc, except instead of reading from the keyboard, we're, re we're reading from a file. All the rest of the code is exactly the same. Okay. And yeah, we should probably do a for loop or maybe a while loop or something like that. So one of the most common operations we do with files is, you know, when the program launches, there's usually like a splash screen and a loading bar. And what's happening is that, you know, you launch the game or whatever, it's going to preload all of the assets, all of the art, all of the sound, all that stuff. It loads it all up into, into RAM so that it doesn't need to pause when the game's running to load, you know, the entire 1812 overture or something like that. Okay. So, um, this is starting to like get you guys into like professional programming territory, right? Your program runs, it loads a bunch of things into vectors and things like that. Uh, when you quit, you save them back to disk so you can keep your progress. So, um, let's show you guys how to load from a file into, um, a vector. Them and Okay. So let's put some more numbers in here. Okay. So I've got a bunch of numbers and I'm here in main and I don't know how many numbers are in the file. Okay. So what I'm going to do is use a while loop, right? Instead of a for loop. And, um, what I'm going to do is do a while true. Oh, uh, one thing to check for is uh, if not dog. So when you open a file up, when you open up a file, make sure that it actually opened because there's always a possibility that the user like deleted Mincrelli, you know, just because I don't know what this file is deleted, you know? So uh, immediately after opening the file, uh, check to make sure that it's not false because if the file is not there, it's going to return false. And yeah, so do something like this error file not found. That's your classic error message, right? And quit. Okay, so we do that. Works fine. But if I move mincorelli.txt to min.txt and run it, then it's going to not find the file. I mistyped it. And there we go. Okay. So that's that's always the first thing you should do is just check to see if an error occurred and then give give the user a helpful notification that they deleted some system critical thing. But yeah, we're gonna need to do a, we're gonna need to do a loop. We're gonna do a while loop. Okay. So we'll do a while true. And we are just going to over and over again right now. Uh, read from the file and then I'm not going to assert this anymore. I'm just going to check to see if an error occurred. And the reason for that is because at some point an error will occur. Like let's say you've got 10 numbers in the file. When do you think an error will occur? On what read will an error occur? You got 10 numbers in mincrelli.txt you keep reading, you're in an infinite loop. Give me more numbers, give me more numbers, give me more numbers. At what point would you guess that an error would occur? Given what you know about C++, just take a guess. I don't expect you to know this. There's 10 numbers. How many times can you read from it before an error occurs? So we just read the 10th number, then dog is invalid at that point. If it isn't an integer, that's also true. Yeah, if we ever get something that's not an integer, then um, it's game over. Right. It'll break at that point. Zero? On the 11th number. That's correct, Otal, uh, or Patrick. Yeah, on the 11th number. So it'll read 10 numbers just fine, assuming they're all integers. When you go to read the 11th number, you're like, give me an integer. And C++ is like, there's no integers left. Sorry. Error. So that's why we do this rather than dying, right? 
because at some point there will be an error. You, you say, keep giving me integers, give me integers. And at some point you go right off the edge of the file. C++, C++ is like red card. There's nothing left. And then you're like, okay, I'm out of here. Peace. And then you break. And that's how easy it is. And so if we do this, then um, you can see it just sits there and reads all the numbers out of the file. All those numbers were red. So uh, let's make a vector. We're going to make a vector of integers. Or... Let's actually do doubles. Uh, we don't need this part anymore with the keyboard. We don't need you anymore. Let's just talk about this. And let's do doubles. Double x. Vector of doubles. In fact, that okay so it's going to read one x at a time one double at a time and then uh, right now it's printing to the screen but we don't need that anymore because we know that it's working so instead of printing to the screen we're going to add it to the vector do you guys remember pushback this is crucial this is one of the most common functions you're going to use uh, like i said it's a very common code pattern to start with a vector of size zero and then grow it. So you start with a vector of size zero because you don't know how big the file is. You know, you don't know how many numbers are in there. So you have zero to begin with. And then every time you read a number in, if an error didn't occur, if there's no squirrel in there, if it came in successfully, then we uh, add it to the vector, okay? And then at the end of this loop, we're gonna have a vector that is filled with all of the numbers in the file. And this is a very, very common thing to do. You run, your program launches and then uh, your program launches and then you load from disk a bunch of data and um, and then you're good to go okay. uh, do you want do you guys remember how to print the vector anyone how do you print all of the elements in a vector can you remember Range based for loop. One student is typing. Nope, he stopped typing. He saw that I'm about to give the answer. Uh, so for every double in the vector, we're going to see out it to the screen. And so there we go. So the vector contains cat and curly. You can see here's the file. Here's what is being loaded. Always check the first element. Always check the last element. Make sure that you're not engaging in any off by one behavior. Uh, if you screw up, by the way, um, if you screw up, then like you do something like this, where you switch the uh, order, you'll end up with an extra element at the end. So, um, check to make sure you didn't go off the edge of the file before adding it to the vector. Okay. So, uh, how to read from a file? Um, loading from a file into a vector. Okay, so with that, uh, we're about to switch into lab time. And uh, what you're going to do today is uh, in lab time, it's a classic computer science assignment called rainfall. It's uh, one of the few sort of standardized problems that are asked at universities across the world in different programming languages in Java and Python and C and C++. And it's used as sort of a benchmark to evaluate um, computer science students, right? Because there's really no, it's really hard to actually s see if you're getting a good education at Harvard or here, right? Because if they don't teach C++, and I do, and I make the test, I'm going to be like, hey, what does Fstream do? You know, the Harvard people are going to be like, I don't know. I don't know C++. You know, it's, it's actually really hard to make a sort of 
apples to apples comparison between different computer science programs. But rainfall is one of them, okay? And so the way that rainfall works, what you're gonna do in lab time is this. Lab time. Step one, make a file filled with doubles, some zeros, some negatives, some positives, okay? And you just do that with bin, right? Just bin the file. Step two, open the file in C++, like that, like our dog right there, right? Step three, read the contents of the file into a vector of doubles, discarding, discarding negative numbers. Why? Because what we're doing is we're reading meteorological data. Basically, we've got a sensor out in the rainforest somewhere, and that rainforest sensor every day is reporting how much rain we got that day. And sometimes it's 10 inches of rain, sometimes it's zero, sometimes an error occurs and the sensor reports negative 500 inches. Okay? You can't get negative rainfall. It's not possible. So you have to discard any time the sensor reports that there is negative um, rainfall that day. Just throw it away, ignore it, don't count it for anything. Okay, so... Step four, step four, report the average rainfall. Okay. So we've gone over averaging a, 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 a vector before. You should be able to do that, no problems. Um, maybe try using accumulate in the So there is a, a function called accumulate that adds up all the elements in a, in a vector. It doesn't save you very much typing because the for loop is pretty compact too. Uh, but you might want to just try it for kicks and giggles. Um, report how many days had no rain. Um, report the average rainfall just on rainy days, right? So if you had a big long drought, but then you had three days of 100 inches of rain, the average on rainy days would be 100 inches, whereas the average rainfall overall would be quite, quite small. And then finally, step seven, report the five biggest days of rainfall. And uh, in the previous class, not everybody got to step seven, in fact, most didn't. Uh, so I, but you should be able to start working your way through this, okay? So I'm gonna cut off the recording now and you will have until 3.45, so 45 minutes to do this and see how many of the steps you can get done. Screenshot, if you have any questions or troubles, post on the chat channel. That's what we're here for. And then we'll come back at 3.45 and I will solve it in, um, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. Okay. And then at four, there is the Hazleton, Hazleton X credit talk. All right. Pausing now. All right. Welcome back everyone. It is now 345. So we'll now solve rainfall for you. Uh, read. Okay. Make a file filled with some doubles. Um, so we'll do one, two, three, four point four. Fresno, so there's gonna be five days of drought. We'll do some negatives. Okay. <coughs> and uh, actually, I just want to have a couple days of rain. Let's do three days of rain. And all the rest, because we're in Fresno. Bunch of nothing, bunch of bad readings, all the smoke in the air. <coughs> Kind of killing my lungs right now. <coughs> okay, so there's been curly.txt. Step one is done. Open the file in C. Well, we've already done that here. Create the contents of the file into a vector of doubles, discarding negatives. Okay, so I need to throw away all the de negative numbers. And the best way of doing this <coughs> is just to say if the number we read is less than zero, then um, continue. <coughs> okay, now. Um, 
I'm going to do something. Maybe it's not the best solution, but I'm going to do it because it's going to make my life easier and I can code up the solution faster. So I'm actually going to create <clears throat> two different vectors. One that will hold hold all of our valid readings, zeros and positives both. And then I'm going to create another one that is just the rainy days. Okay. And <clears throat> so if, if I get a negative number, it doesn't go into either. It gets discarded. If it's a zero or positive, it goes into all days. <clears throat> and if it's a positive number, in other words, we had rain on that day, then it will go into rainy days dot pushy abaki like that. And now we've got two vectors. So uh, let me just see these out. Boom, boom, boom. All days. <clears throat> just making sure that this thing is working properly. So we can see all days has 4.4, 5.5, 6.6. All the negatives have been discarded. Good. We have cleaned up. We have sanitized our input. We have vetted our input. <clears throat> and then the rainy days are just these three rainy numbers. And the reason why I split it up like this, uh, I didn't need to, but it's just going to make, because some of these things are like, you know, using one, somebody uses the other. It's just going to be easier for me to write the code this way. So we got all days, we got rainy days. <clears throat> Okay, um, report the average rainfall. So uh, the average rainfall, you can compute the average rainfall by adding up all of the data <clears throat> in all days and then dividing by the size of all days. So if you're going to average 10 numbers together, you add 10 numbers together and divide by 10. That's how you do an average. <clears throat> uh, all days sum is equal to accumulate all days dot begin all days dot end starting with zero <coughs> and then I will do the same for rainy days okay. so now I've got uh, <coughs> accumulate is in numeric like that. okay so this will have all of the days here and Let's just see them out. All days sum and rainy days sum <coughs> like that. I like when I can edit the code faster than the compiler can catch the mistakes in it. So uh, the all days sum is 15. Uh, is that right? Is that right? That doesn't look right to me. Uh, what was that? 9, 13. Sixteen point five, right? printing 15. Do I have an integer in here somewhere? Hmm. Yeah, this... Oh, that's why. <coughs> Tricky one. I pass in an integer here it was doing integer accumulation and you might be like well, why do you need to pass in a subtotal well because it requires it and it actually determines whether it should do integer uh, accumulation or a double accumulation based on this number you pass in here just super annoying okay so um good to go good to go good to go all right so now we've got that so now we need to do the average rainfall the average rainfall 
is going to be <coughs> average rainfall is going to be the sum of all the days divided by um, uh, all days dot size. That. So uh, this will do double division because all days sum is a double. <coughs> and then average rainfall on rainy days. Yes. Dot. Okay. Uh, let's get some new lines up in here. Average rainfall is 1.0. Average rainfall in rainy days is 5.5, which is correct. Okay. <coughs> okay, so we've got average rainfall done. Average rainfall in rainy days done. We need to figure out how many dry days there are. <coughs> Again, excuse me. There's just a lot of snow in here right now. So the number of dry days, okay, is going to be all days minus rainy days. So how many all day how many days do we have total? All days. Okay, so <clears throat> number of dry days is equal to the size of all days minus the size of rainy days. Like that. So that's uh, again, this is why I kind of split it into two different vectors, because it just all these computations down below become very easy when you do it that way. It does waste a little bit of RAM, but eh, who cares? So the number of dry days is all days minus the count of all days minus the count of all rainy days. That's our count of dry days. And then finally, um, okay, I think we've got all of it done except for the five biggest days. And so the, the tricky thing, like Otal found out, is that if you don't have five rainy days, then if you loop for int i equals zero i is less than five, it's going to go out of bounds or break, okay? So what we're going to do is sort the uh, uh, rainy days greatest to smallest. So we're going to sort from rainy days dot begin to rainy days dot end. Sorting it greatest to smallest. And let's just print out the whole thing, right? So don't need to do anymore. Not the rainy days sorted greatest to smallest, and there we go. Okay, so <clears throat> now that it's sorted greatest to smallest, we want to print five if there's five or more, and we want to print however many we have if um, we have less than five. Okay, so um, int size t to be precise, size t number to print is equal to rainy days dot size. So if the rainy days dot size is greater than or equal to five, then it's going to be five. Okay. So if we have 10 rainy days, we're just going to print the top five. Otherwise it's going to be rainy days dot size. So if we have three, if the size of the rainy days vector is three, um, we're going to print three elements. Okay. And now we're going to use a for loop for size t i equals zero. I is less than num to print. Plus plus. So we're going to just print the first num to print of the, of the vector. It's probably going to be five unless we have a small vector, in which case it will be however size the vector is. Rainy days dot at. Uh, top. Num to print. Rainy days. And that's the whole assignment. So that was 11 minutes or something. So the top three rainy days, 6.6, 5.5, 4.4. Um, if I add more rainy days to min curly dot text, let's throw a 0.99 on there and a 
10.01 and an 100, then uh, I don't even need to recompile the code. Did you see that? That's one of the benefits of reading from a file. If you read from a file, you don't have to recompile every time. You can just read from the file, which oftentimes is a lot faster than recompiling and redoing everything. So you see the top five rainy days now include 100, 10.01, 6.6, 5.5, 4.4. It does not include the smaller ones in here. Okay. And uh, that's, that's rainfall. So that is a classic uh, homework assignment that they will give to sort of assess how good students' uh, programming skills are, usually later in your uh, computer science career. Um, it's not like a, you know, what we did here, we got 45 minutes to do it. It's usually like a homework assignment, you know. Um, so if you weren't able to do it, like, don't beat yourself up. But it is, you know, it is, I think, a good educational experience. So that's it for today. Hazleton's going to be up in three minutes, I hope. Uh, if not, we will be awkwardly staring at it. Uh, yes, sir, start at four. Okay. Well, that's three minutes from now, dude. So, okay. <laughs> okay, he's here. All right, cool. All right, so uh, Hazleton will take over. Let me unmute him. And um, I have to go to the school to make a delivery. So, Hazleton, uh, is it possible for you to record it? If not, um, maybe I'll set up a recording or something. I don't know, before I leave. So that's um, it for today. I can download OBS real quick. Yeah, yeah, that would work. And uh, let me uh, let me give you permissions so that you can unmute yourself so you don't constantly get muted if you like leave the channel and come back. All right, and do I have... Um Stream permissions too. Try now. I just I just boop. Right. I just boosted your server permissions. Anyway, let me let me turn off this recording, and then uh, I'll let, I'll let you figure that out. Right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Work on RPG and have fun.